Well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here and the, the great B event. Uh, very exciting. I, I'm, I'm jet lagged and I've, eaten, I've drunk lots of mead, so um, <laughs> bear with me. Um, excellent. Uh, okay, so I've been studying bumblebees for 20 or something years. Um, uh, not honeybees, which obviously were the sort of focus of much of what was going on out there. And I, I, I thought I should start by just pointing out that there are lots of different species of bee, because an awful lot of people, I think, uh, think there's one species of bee, and it lives in a box, and it makes honey. Um, <laughs> but if you ask them to draw a bee, they will draw something that is round and fat with yellow and black stripes, which is actually a bumblebee. Um, but then that's just the tip of the iceberg, because there are loads of other species of bee as well, and most people have no idea that they exist at all. Um, so there are actually about 20,000 species of bee in the world, um, about 4,000 in, in North America that we know of, and I'm sure there are some that have yet to be discovered. Um, so, so there we go. Honeybee on the left, the thing that does live in a box and makes honey. Uh, bumblebees, the big, furry, kind of wild cousins of honeybees in the middle, and then there's, there's all these other weird and wonderful things. And I just wanted to start with a few pictures of some of these other solitary bees. I'm not actually going to say too much about them after this, but at the very least I've shown you some pictures of them, so you know they exist. Um, so they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Some don't look much like bees at all, actually. I mean, that, that most people would think was a wasp. Um, actually, it's a bee, but it's a cuckoo bee. So um, quite a large proportion of bees have... Um, become parasites on other bees. They, we call them cuckoo bees because they sneak their eggs into the nests of hard-working proper bees um, uh, and sort of steal their food, just like the bird cuckoo. But it is a bee. Um, there are beautiful things like this blue-banded amygdala, um, stunning things. Um, there are, some of them are absolutely tiny. Um, this is by f certainly not the smallest. And it, quite a lot of these solitary bees, because they don't have a, a hive to go back to at night, um, they sleep out. And it's quite common for them to sleep by finding the edge of, end of a twig and just biting it with their mandibles, which is what this one's doing. It's fast asleep, and then it just curls its legs up, and the, its only point of contact is the mandibles gripping the, the twig there. Um, there are some really stunning things, like th these orchid bees, which sadly you don't get here, but they're in Florida, and they're in Central America and Mexico. So not so far away. Um, these, these are amazing, beautiful things. Um, there are lots of different species. And one of their features is the males have giant hollow back legs. This is what this is here. Um, with a little hole in the top. And they, they, um, they, each species collects perfume from a particular species of orchid, stores it in its hollow legs, and then uses it to, to seduce a female um, <laughs> by sprinkling her with the the pollen, the, the scent from its legs. Um, there, there are also lots of insects that are easily mistaken for bees, and forgive me if you've seen this before, um, but this is a deeply embarrassing cover for the poor guys that published this book, um, <laughs> because it's not actually uh, a bee at all. It's a, it's a fly. In fact, it's not even a very good mimic of a bee. Um, it's, it's not, I should say, it's not the fault of the people who wrote the book, whose names are at the bottom. They, they never got to see the jacket before about 5,000 copies were printed, and I can imagine how annoyed they were. Anyway. Um, so, but these are the ones that I specialize in, in studying, bumblebees. Um, there are about 250 species in the world. You've got 46, if I recall, in North America. We've got about 25 in the UK. Um, so what are bumblebees? They all belong to one genus, Bombus, which is kind of a nice, nice Latin name. Um, they're, they're social bees, but they're kind of intermediate between the honeybee and those solitary bees. Uh, that I talked about, um, in that their, 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 social, their social life is, is simpler and their colonies, colonies are much smaller. Um, so the bumblebee life cycle is probably easiest to pick it up in the spring. They have an annual life cycle which starts um, with the queens coming out of hibernation um, in spring and the queens are great big, furry, uh, very beautiful uh, creatures and you see them flying around looking for somewhere to nest. They usually nest in a little hole in the ground and they need to they need a, an old abandoned mouse nest or vole nest um, as insulation to, to, um, to successfully nest themselves. Um, and if they find that, 
they, they make a little ball of pollen, they lay eggs in it, and they sit, sit on it, and they incubate just like a bird. Um, so I remember being taught when I was at school that insects are cold-blooded, and only mammals and birds are warm-blooded, meaning that they have a regulated, stable body temperature. Uh, cold-blooded creatures, their body temperature is, is the same as the ambient temperature. Bumblebees are one of a small number of um, insects that actually regulate their body temperature by producing heat internally. And, and a bee, when she's active, actually has a body temperature rather similar to our own, about 35 degrees C. Anyway, so the queen, she shivers to keep her brood warm um, and presses her tummy against them just like a bird. If all goes well, within a few weeks, um, her offspring hatches young workers, which are all female. They're miniature versions of the mum. And they then take over the foraging, and the nest grows through the spring until the middle of the summer. And then it switches to producing new queens and males. And they fly off from the nest, and they mate. Those, the queens, they just mate once in their whole life. Um, uh, and as soon as they've mated, they burrow into the ground, sometimes as early as June or July, and then they sleep all the way through to the next spring. And the old nest dies off, uh, the males die off, and it, it's kind of sad, actually. That, um, so for reasons no one's ever really worked out, there are about seven times as many males born as new queens. Which, and, and the males, their only job in they don't do any work in the nest. Um, their only job in life is to mate. Um, but because there are so many of them relative to the number of queens, that means that six out of seven males never get to do the only thing that they were born to do, which is <laughs> kind of sad. Um, anyway, and so, so at this time of year, all the, the old nests have just died off. Uh, the males have died, the workers have died, the old queen has died. Nothing is left but those young queens under the ground waiting till next spring. Um, if you look at where bumblebees are found in the world, it shows you something kind of interesting. So, uh, we think bees evolved about 120 million years ago, back in the age of dinosaurs. Um, bumblebees came on along a bit later, well, a lot later, about 30 million years ago. Um, and we think they evolved uh, somewhere in the Himalayas. And, and still to this day, um, the place where you could find most bumblebee species, which is what these numbers show you, um, is somewhere in the eastern Himalayas. So there's a number 60 there. So if you wanted to plan a holiday to go and find bumblebees, you probably don't, but just supposing you did, that would be the place to go. Um, quite hard to get to, actually. But anyway, um, and we think that that's probably roughly where they originated. And then they spread out from there west to, to, to Europe and east through Siberia. And they hopped over into Alaska and then down through the Americas, past where we, we are now. And a few species got into South America. But they don't like warm weather. The only way they got into South America was through the mountains. Um, they never got into Africa or places like Australia because they can't cope with heat. They, they overheat. Um, uh, they're essentially, they're wearing big furry coats, and uh, hot weather is, is not good for bumblebees. So they're actually here, most of the species that you would find are, are right at the southern edges of their ranges. And obviously, if, if climate change warms things up a bit, that won't be so good for, for bumblebees. Um, so they're really good at, they're well adapted to cold places. They live right up into, there are species, there's one called Bombus polaris that lives way up in the Arctic Circle. They can fly around in weather that no other insect can fly in. There's a, it's a terrible picture, but there's a bee in the middle there feeding on flowers in the, in the middle of winter with snow all over the flowers. Um, there's really, I can't think of a single other insect that, that could do that. Um, and if you take an infrared picture of a bumblebee, um, the, the the heat is produced from the flight muscles. So the, the thing called the thorax, which is where the wings are attached on a bee, um, is packed full of muscle. And she, to stay in the air, a bumblebee has to flap her wings about 200 times a second. If you try flapping your arms 200 times a second, you'll get very warm. And that's, so that's where the heat comes from. And it's kept in by, by the fur. So that's all very well. And it's very useful that they can fly in cold weather. But there is a cost to this, which is that it uses loads and loads of energy to keep them in the air. Um, so somebody once worked out that um, a running man uh, burns the calories in a Mars bar in about an hour of running, which is a kind of depressing statistic if you're running to, to run off that Mars bar you ate earlier. Um, 
Uh, if you were lucky enough to be a man-sized bumblebee, which would be kind of exciting, um, you, it would take you just 30 seconds of flying to burn the calories in a, in a Mars bar. So they need loads of energy, which means they, they need lots of flowers, nectar-rich, sugar-rich uh, flowers to keep them in the air. And if there aren't enough flowers, they become grounded, they can't fly, and they're in trouble. Um, I'm just going to read you a tiny bit from, from A Sting in the Tail, which is actually my earliest memory of bumblebees from when I was only six or seven, I think. I'm a bit hazy as to exactly when it was. On one occasion, after a heavy summer rainstorm, I found a number of bedraggled bumblebees clinging to my buddleia and decided to dry them out. Unfortunately for the bees, I was perhaps a bit too young to have a good grasp of the practicalities. With hindsight, finding my mum's hairdryer and giving them a gentle blow dry <laughs> might have been the most sensible option. Instead, I laid the torpid bees on the hot plate of the electric cooker, covered them in a layer of tissue paper and turned the hot plate onto low. Being young, I got bored of waiting for them to warm up and wandered off to feed my gerbils. Sadly, my attention didn't return to the bees until I noticed the smoke. The tissue paper had caught fire and the poor bees had been frazzled. I felt terrible. My first foray into bumblebee conservation was a catastrophic disaster. <laughs> I've got slightly better. Um, so anyway, but those bees, that actually what you should do if you find a bee that can't, that's sitting on the ground, that can't fly, she's too cold, um, give her some sugar water. And very often she'll fire up her flight muscles and five minutes later she'll, she'll zoom off. Um, don't put them on the stage. Um, <laughs> So, but if you then jump on, uh, actually, the, the 20 years or so, I, fir I first got really interested in studying bumblebees scientifically because I noticed something interesting. I was sitting in a field, of, a flowery meadow near, uh, in the south of England, and, and I saw something that actually anyone can see in their back garden or any, in a park where there's flowers, any time of year that bees are out and active. Um, if you watch a bee in a patch of flowers, she flies from flower to flower, obviously. But actually, she doesn't land on every flower. She often flies up to a flower, like this bee is doing, with her antennae out in front. She doesn't actually touch it. Uh, and at the last second, she veers away. And she might do that two, three, four times before she actually lands on a flower and puts her tongue into the flower and drinks the nectar. And I, was, I watched them do that. I thought, I don't know why. What, what, what's she doing? What's wrong with the flowers that she doesn't land on? Um, and it took, it took five years to, to fully unravel what was going on. I had a PhD student, Jane Stout, who helped me. Um, and I'll cut a very long story short, but um, it turns out that every time um, a bee lands on a flower, she leaves behind a little tiny smear of, of oily hydrocarbons, not deliberately, but just in the same way that you or I, if we pick up a wine glass, uh, we leave a, an oily fingerprint on it. Um, every time a bee touches a flower, she leaves a, a sort of smelly footprint behind. And what, the, what subsequent bees do is they sniff flowers um, to see if they can detect the faintest whiff of the smell of bee. And if they can, that means that somebody else has recently been on the flower and will have taken the nectar. So there's no point in landing because there won't be anything in the flower. Um, and it just saves them half a second that otherwise they would spend landing and putting their tongue into the flower, which might not seem like much, but a bee might visit 10,000 flowers in a day. Um, so half a second saved that many times over adds up to a, a, a lot. And it means that they're foraging more efficiently than they would otherwise be. So the bees visit lots of flowers to, to keep themselves fueled up and to feed their offspring. Um, and that makes them really good pollinators. Um, and now, I don't want to get into, into fights with honey beekeepers who may be present about whose bees are the best pollinators. Um, the long and the short of it is that different bees are, uh, pollinate different things um, more or less well. So there are some flowers and crops that are well pollinated by honey bees, and there are others that honey bees are absolutely rubbish at. Um, tomatoes are a really good example. Tomatoes need to be buzz-pollinated to, to pollinate them, which means that they need to be, actually the flower needs to be vibrated to get the pollen to come out. Um, honeybees have never worked out how to do that, um, so they're useless for pollinating your tomatoes, but bumblebees are very good at it, and for that reason, um, almost every tomato you've eaten um, since about 1988 was probably pollinated by a bumblebee, and I'll explain that slightly strange statistic in a bit. 
Um, but anyway, so bumblebees are important pollinators, uh, as are those solitary bees. Um, particularly for bumblebees, they're great at uh, lots of vegetables, things like runner beans. Blueberries are mostly pollinated by bumblebees, raspberries, strawberries. Early spring flowers that flower when the weather's cold before honeybees can really get going are often well pollinated by bumblebees. So we should be worried that some of them are disappearing. So I'll show you first an example from the UK. This is a lovely bumblebee called the, the Great Yellow Bumblebee, um, which used to be found all over Britain in the first half of the 20th century. Um, but by the second half of the 20th century, most of them had gone from England and Wales. And, and that's where you have to go if you want to see one today. They're only in the wilds of the north and west of Scotland. They've disappeared from 90-whatever percent of their, of their former British range. Um, and it's not just happening in Britain. This is happening, so far as we know, um, all over the world. Um, so closer to home here, this is Bombus of Finis, which um, is a bit of a sort of um, poster bee for the conservation of bumblebees over here, because sadly, it's, it's a very pretty bee, but it's declined dramatically in the last 20 years. Um, this used to be a really common East Coast bumblebee. It used to be one of the commonest bees in people's gardens and parks. Um, and in the space of about 10 years, it became one of the rarest bees in Eastern America. The, the, the map isn't perhaps that helpful. The red dots show you the more recent records, but they're very few and far between now. So they've gone from being very common to very scarce and hard to find. Um, so it's the, 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 the bees seem to be in trouble. Um, actually, while things were in California, I should also mention Franklin's bumblebee, which is, uh, was found in Northern California and Southern Oregon, um, uh, but it's now, we think, the, the globally extinct. Um, it was last seen in 2006, and it seems that it's almost certainly gone forever. Um, we'd really like to have better data, actually, on how, uh, how populations of bees are changing over time. So we have maps, like the ones I've just shown you, but we don't have... Um, we don't have data on how big the population is. And actually what we'd really like uh, is a measure of how many nests there are, because the nests are, the, 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 each nest is one breeding female. Um, so if we could survey bumblebee nests um, and see how the density or the number of nests was changing over time, that would be a really useful thing to have. It would show us which species were declining, which ones were doing okay, and so on. Um, but it's really hard to find their nests, because they're in holes in the ground, usually. Um, often very little tiny holes that you can't spot. Um, so, a few years ago, um, we, inspired by the fact that in the UK, badgers are one of the biggest predators of bumblebees. They sniff them out at night, and they dig up the whole nest and eat everything. They eat the adult bees, uh, all the grubs and the wax and, and the whole darned lot. Um, not, I'm not suggesting we should do, kill badgers, by the way. That's a big <laughs> controversy in the UK at the moment. But, um, but if badgers could sniff them out, we figured dogs should be able to sniff them out. Um, so one Friday afternoon after a trip to the pub, we, we, <laughs> we, we rang the army, um, who have a training camp in, in the UK for training. Normally, they train dogs to find explosives. Um, uh, and we rang them up and said, would you train a dog to find bumblebee nests? And we thought they'd just laugh at us. But they, amazingly, they didn't. I think they were bored of training dogs to find explosives and <laughs> fancied a challenge. So they, they trained us um, Chad here. Or they started training Chad. And it turned out he was actually useless and was, um, he, he, he was sacked after just two weeks. Um, and we ended up with, with Quinn, who, who was quite good. He found bumblebee nests. He, he actually spent two years up in the highlands of Scotland looking for nests of those great yellow bumblebees. But he wasn't as good as we'd hoped he would be. He, he found a, a nest every two or three days, and we were figuring he should be able to find more than that. So we had a third dog trained up. This was Toby. He, he was the best sniffer dog we ever had. This is Steph, he, who was his, his handler. She did her PhD with Toby. Um, and it did kind of work. He found hundreds of nests over three years, but never as many as we would have really hoped. And the funny thing was that he would find a tiny little bumblebee nest that we would never have spotted, and then he would walk straight past a whopping great nest that we knew was there <laughs> without twitching his nose at all. And we, we could never work out why it was that he would find some nests and, and not others. Um, and oddly enough, Steph actually, after three years of traipsing around behind this dog, um, became better at finding bumblebee nests than the dog was. Um, 
which, which kind of made the dog a bit of a waste of space at that point. So he was, he was eventually retired. He actually, he, he and Steph still live together in the, in the wilds of Scotland. Anyway, when they found nests, we wanted to, to monitor them to see what happened subsequently. Um, uh, so they put cameras on the nests. Um, and they filmed them continuously, 24 hours a day, until the nest um, expired. And we wanted to see whether they produced new queens, whether they got eaten by a badger, what, what happened to them. Um, and I'm just going to show you a little bit of footage. It's, kind of, it's, it's really rubbish resolution photography. There's some strange noises coming from outside. Um, uh, the, the, the because they had to record 24 hours a day, it's very l low resolution. Um, but this is a new bit of natural history, something that had never been seen before uh, and, and wouldn't have been discovered if it weren't, I guess, ultimately for Toby and Steph. So I, I'm hoping this works now. Um, but before I start it, so that little hole there is a hole into a bumblebee nest. Um, and it's only about, I don't know, um, half an inch across. And there's a bee here, those are the wings of the bee, and she's just going to go into that hole, but then um, it's what happens immediately afterwards that... So, if just wait a minute, another bee's going to come in a second. Uh, where, where is it? Yeah, there it comes. And then, there it is. Um, and it, so it turns out this wasn't a one-off. Um, it turns out that we, so we had eight of the nests that they filmed were regularly visited by a different bird, and the bird would come every day and just sit outside and just pick <laughs> off the bees. And each bird had learned its own way of dismembering the bees. So the most popular way was that they'd snip the top of the thorax off and scoop out the flight muscles, and they'd leave this little pile of identically um, dismembered bees, um, or some of them would chop the tail off the bee and scoop the, the contents of the body out from the bottom, but they all had their own kind of pet way of doing it. Um, anyway, it's, it's, I'm not suggesting that we should, we should kill these birds either. Um, they're, they're great tits, we call them in, in Britain. I don't know what, you don't have the same species here. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a bit of natural history that had never been seen before. Okay, so I'm just going to say a little bit about why we think bees are declining before I move on to some more happy things about what we can do to help them. So um, the biggest reason bees are declining around the world um, is, is essentially the way farming has changed. Modern farming, um, the model of farming which has huge fields, monocultures, which lots of pesticides are applied to, lots of herbicides, so there's no weeds, there's no flowers, um, are pretty obviously not very uh, good places for bees. So in Britain, we used to have lots of hay meadows, beautiful flowery grasslands. You probably can't see it very well. I'll show you a better picture in a second. But that's one of the surviving fragments up in Scotland where those great yellow bumblebees live. Uh, we used to have, in quite a small country, we had 7 million acres of flower-rich hay meadows at the beginning of the 20th century, and we, we ploughed up 98% of them during the 20th century and turned them into cereal fields, silage fields, and, and so on. But it's not just happened in Britain, obviously. It's, it's, happen it's, it's, that, it's, it's happened all over the world as, as um, agriculture has intensified. I'll say a bit more about that in a second. The, the other issues are disease and pesticides and climate change. Um, and each one of those I'll say a tiny bit about, apart from the climate change one, which essentially there's, there was, there's been very little study of this, but just recently a paper came out um, where they'd analysed changes in the distributions of bumblebees in Europe and North America. And it seems that, that as you would expect, as it's warmed up, the, the southern edges of bumblebees have shifted northwards. They've disappeared in the warmer parts of their range. Um, but the odd thing is that they haven't shifted northwards at the top of their range. So it's not that their range has moved up, it's their range has got squashed from the bottom. And no one really knows why they're not moving at the top. But obviously that's potentially bad news. Um, anyway, to come back to the, to the farming, the way farming has changed, this, this is a lovely example of one of the, the flower-rich grassland in Europe. Um, and you have similar things here. So this is a Californian example of, of one of your, um, uh, one of the fragments of surviving flower-rich grasslands. And, but in the distance, you can kind of see what much of that's been turned into. And it's hardly surprising that if you get rid of this and instead have this, that you're not going to have many bees or, in fact, any other kind of wildlife. Um, 
This, this is a bit childish in a way, but I've, I've dropped down in Google Earth, and you can go into Street View in, all over the world and see what it looks like. And there's a scary number of places where it looks exactly the same. It looks like this. Um, so I'm just going to give you three examples. This is, this is I think, is northern France. Uh, and that, I think, is um, Holland. Uh, but then this is a, in the United States. Um, I forget which state. Um, but there are so many places which essentially look like this. There are no flowers. Um, there is nothing but this tiny little strip on the sides of the road, and then thousands of acres of monocultures of crops. And if, I mean, obviously, we need to grow food to feed people, um, but um, we have to accept that if we, if, if we adopt this as the way of growing food, which is what we largely have done, then it's going to expunge wildlife from big chunks of the face of the planet because nothing really can survive in this kind of place. Um, and I personally think that we should be questioning this model of global food production, but that's kind of a story for another day. Um, I mentioned disease. I'm just going to say a tiny bit about bee diseases, because this is definitely one of the problems that they've faced in recent years. And it's not very widely known, apart from the varroa mite, which many of you, certainly if you're beekeepers, will have heard of. So bees naturally have lots of diseases. Insects have lots of diseases. They have, they have bacteria and viruses and fungal pathogens. And, and then they have bigger, they have, they have parasites, mites, and so on that attack them. And that's perfectly normal and natural and part of life's rich tapestry. Um, but we've rather foolishly moved their uh, pathogens around the world. So to start with, with honeybees, um, I don't know if everyone knows this, but honeybees aren't native to the Americas at all. They're an introduced species. They came from southeastern Europe and the Middle East, um, but were moved here. But when they were moved here, we didn't know anything really about bee diseases. So we brought, with, we brought diseased hives from Europe to the Americas and introduced a whole load of bee diseases to North America and South America and Australia and, and so on. Um, so that was happening hundreds of years ago. And those aren't, I should say, exclusively honeybee diseases. Most bee diseases that we know of will happily infect a whole range of species, bumblebees, solitary bees, and so on. So those bee diseases we brought from Europe to, to the Americas, we have no idea, actually, what impact they had, because no one was studying your wild bees um, 300 years ago, or whenever exactly it was that honeybees were brought over. Anyway, more recently, we've messed, we've, we've messed things up even more by starting up a trade in commercial bumblebees, which is something that lots of people aren't really aware of. Um, it started in, in the 1980s um, when a Dutch guy worked out that he worked out how to breed bumblebees. Uh, he did it in his garden shed. And he, the reason he did it was because he lived near a, a farmer who had a great big uh, glass house full of tomatoes. And um, the farmer was employing people with vibrating wands to walk around and buzz all the flowers of the tomatoes, because that was the only way to pollinate tomatoes at, at the time. In, in a glass house. You can imagine how boring that job must have been. Um, and of course, I mentioned earlier, bumblebees are really good at pollinating tomatoes. And so this guy started breeding them and supplying nests like this one to his local tomato grower. And he, all he had to do was put the nests inside his glass house and open the door, and the bees would pollinate all the tomatoes beautifully. Um, in no time at all, that grew into a, a, a factory producing bumblebees, and, and then all the rival companies set up. And now there are factories all over the world churning out literally millions of bumblebee nests in boxes. And sadly, once again, um, they're all full of diseases, and we're shipping new, a new set of diseases um, around the world. There's a very strong suspicion that that rapid decline of um, the rusty-patched bumblebee, Bombus affinis, in eastern North America, and probably the decline of, and the extinction of Franklin's bumblebee, were driven by European bee diseases brought over by this trade. We don't know for sure, um, but it's by far the most widely accepted theory. In South America right now, um, there's, there's something awful going on. Um, the Chilean government in 1998 decided to introduce European factory-reared bumblebees to Chile. Uh, not just in a glass house, but they just put them out in the field deliberately and let them all go because they thought it would be nice to have another species of bumblebee in Chile. I don't really know why they did it. They had their own native bumblebees. But anyway, they introduced some European ones for luck. Um, they didn't think to check that they didn't have diseases, and they introduced a whole bunch of European diseases that aren't native to South America, and to which it turns out the South American bumblebees have no natural resistance at all. 
and they're being wiped out on a huge scale. The bottom uh, third of South America now, ha now has no bumblebees left in it at all, apart from these European invaders, which is really awful. Um, anyway, on that depressing note, I'll leave diseases and, and move on to a much more cheerful topic, pesticides. Um, <laughs> It does get happier, this talk, I promise. Um, so I, I, this is a really complicated subject, and I have a whole talk on bees and pesticides, which, if you really want to hear it, um, is on YouTube. Um, if you Google my name and, and Plymouth, because it was at Plymouth University, you can, and you have to be very bored, but um, if you've got <laughs> an hour to waste, then by all means have a listen. Um, so this is the, the very short version. Um, this, the, this bewildering table I flashed up, I'm obviously not, ex you probably can't read it at the back anyway, um, but it, it, it's trying to, I'm trying to illustrate a point. This is data from, we, we're studying the health of bumblebees uh, in the south of England, in farmland, and what impact pesticides might be having on them. And we asked the farmers in the local area to tell us what pesticides they put on each crop in each growing cycle, from when the crop is sown to when it's harvested. And so these are the pesticides applied to one canola field between sowing and harvest about nine months, ten months later. Um, and as far as I know, this is fairly typical for England. This farmer isn't especially bad. Um, so that one field had 20 different types of pesticide and a couple of types of fertilizer applied to it. Um, all sorts of fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, molluscicides, and so on. Um, I just kind of would say that if you were growing stuff to, to eat yourself or to feed to your kids, would you put 20 different pesticides on, uh, on it and then be happy to eat it? I don't think you would. I wouldn't. Um, and yet, basically, this is how food is produced. In fact, if this, if this was an apple orchard, the list would be two or three times as long. There's an incredible amount of pesticides go onto apples. And they look so beautiful and shiny, but the reason they look beautiful and shiny is usually because they've been drenched in all manner of pesticides. Anyway, um, as I say, it's, it's a long and complicated story. Um, most of the attention on pesticides and bees has focused on one particular type of pesticides, neonicotinoids, or neonics for short. Um, and it is complicated, and I haven't got time to go into it, but I, I just thought I'd tell you the bare bones of, of, of it. Um, so these are neurotoxins that were invented in the 80s and came on the market in the mid-90s. Um, this graph shows you how use increased in the UK over time. So they came in in 94, and they were really popular with farmers the, the world over. I just happen to have data from the UK, but it would look exactly the same for the US. Um, and the, reason the main reason for their popularity was they're really easy for the farmer to use because he buy, they're, they're mostly used as a seed dressing. So this is canola seed that's been pre-treated with insecticide. Um, and the farmer just buys it like that. He doesn't have to do anything at all. He just sows it in the ground. Um, and the insecticide is water-soluble. It dissolves into the soil. And then it's supposed to be sucked up by the growing plant. And it's systemic, so it goes to all parts of the plant and makes it toxic to, to any insect that might try and eat the crop, which is, you, you can see from a farmer's perspective, that's great. Um, the problem is if you put them on a flowering crop, like uh, canola or sunflowers or maize, that bees collect the pollen or nectar from, then because it's systemic and it goes to all parts of the plant, it goes into the pollen and the nectar, which means that bees are then consuming really potent neurotoxins if they feed on those crops. And that essentially is the, is, is the heart of the problem. To illustrate how toxic they are, toxicity of, of, of things like pesticides is measured by an LD50, the lethal dose that kills 50% of your beasties. Um, uh, and I've got two LD50s there. One, one of imidacloprid is a, one of these neonics, and DDT is a very well-known and largely banned nasty. Um, but actually, from a bee's perspective, it's six or seven thousand times DDT is six or seven thousand times less toxic than one of these neonics. And I'm not suggesting for a minute we should be spraying DDT, um, but it's an interesting point. Um, so four nanograms is what it takes to give an LD50 to a honeybee. Um, with four billionths of a gram, which isn't very much. Um, to put that another way, one teaspoon, which five grams, what you can hold in a teaspoon, is of, a, of a neonic is enough to give an LD50 to one and a quarter billion honeybees. And we're chucking these things all over 
pretty much every field in, in America and Europe at the moment, um, which, is, which is kind of pause for thought, I think, and it's, it's, hard, it, it, it's not a great leap of logic to suggest that this probably isn't very good for our bees and for our other wild insects. Um, you can also buy them for garden use, and I can never resist showing this slide. Uh, it's this kind of... So, Bayer is a German company, and we're, people joke in Britain that the Germans don't have a sense of humour, but clearly they have an excellent sense of humour, because they must do to be advertising free seeds for bees with your jar of um, uh, home near Nick spray to kill the bugs. Um, I guess the idea is you bl grow beautiful flowers to attract in the bees, and then you can kill them really efficiently with your bug spray. Um, they did withdraw this promotion fairly quickly, actually. Um, <laughs> But nonetheless, so you can buy these things in your local garden centre. You would also, if you have a dog or a cat or a rabbit, you probably drip them on the bag back of its neck. The, mo the most common anti-flea treatments um, for domestic pets are these neurotoxins. And they're really quite toxic to vertebrates as well as uh, bees. So you may think twice before you put the stuff on your dog next time. Anyway, um, to finish the doom and gloom, I just wanted to show you these pictures. Um, which are rather pretty, but these show people in southwest China, quite close to where we think bumblebees originally evolved. But they're hand pollinating their apples and pears. Um, because they've killed all the bees, there are no bees at all left in this region, so they have to hand pollinate their crops now which is a really kind of scary vision of what the future might hold. Uh, I mean, clearly it wouldn't be viable for a, a, a farmer in North America to hand pollinate his canola crops. So we need to make sure that we don't end up in this situation. So how can we do that? What can we do? Well, the good thing is that there's lots we can do individually. So a lot of conservation stories um, seem kind of doom and gloom. Um, you know, you, you, there's so like the rainforest being chopped down, Polar bears, the ice caps are melting. As an individual, it's very hard to think what you can do to solve any of those issues. Um, but with bees, because they live all around us, uh, uh, they live in our gardens and so on, there's actually lots that we can do to help. Now, um, I started a, a, a charity to, to look after bumblebees in the UK. I'm not suggesting you should join a UK charity. That would probably be a bit silly. Um, but the things that the charity does um, are things that anyone could do. And in, in fact, the Xerxes Society are the nearest equivalent to, to the Bumblebee Conservation Trust in the USA. The Xerxes have, obviously, most of you will have seen their stand outside. They do a fantastic job of looking after all insects in North America. Um, anyway. The reason I started this charity was that uh, this is about 10 years ago. Um, I'd been studying bumblebees at the time for, for a decade or so and publishing scientific papers about why they were declining and what things we might do to, to help them. And scientific papers are, are just read by other scientists. Um, and probably by like 10 scientists, if you're lucky, around the world that work on bumblebees. Um, it's a, a, well, actually, I said this to a, co a gathering of scientists on a conference about bees, and someone chirped up from the back, and actually, we don't read them either, which um, <laughs> was a little bit depressing and, and made me think maybe we needed to do something else. Um, we needed to actually try and do something rather than just writing papers about it. Um, so anyway, that's why we started, started the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, which is a membership-based organisation like Xerxes, um, uh, where we're actually trying to get people to sign up to do things to help bees. So what can they actually do? What can you do? Um, well, I guess the, the high-end thing you might do is create um, fields full of flowers, if you happen to have a field. Um, I guess most people don't have a farm or a meadow or whatever, um, but A Buzz in the Meadow, the, the second book that I, I wrote, is about doing that, exactly that down in, in France. Uh, I bought a farm of 33 acres, which at the time was an arable farm uh, 12 years ago, and I've been slowly turning it back into a wildflower meadow. And it's been really cool to see it slowly evolve over time as new species of flower have colonized and as new butterflies and bumblebees and other insects have turned up. Um, it, it's obviously, that, that is fantastic. And one of the big reasons bees have declined is because we've lost these flowery meadows from the countryside. Uh, and anything you can do to, to get involved in recreating those is wonderful. But it's not a, a, perhaps the most practical suggestion I could give to you as to what you might do. There are much smaller things that you can easily do. Firstly, I said at the beginning, most people seem to think there's one species of bee. Um, 
Uh, and clearly there's a job to be done in, in just making people aware that actually there's much more to it than that. There's all these other insects out there that are important, not just bees, but uh, pollinators. And in fact, beyond pollinators, there are, the, the world is full of insects that do important things that are largely forgotten. Um, so we need to kind of raise awareness one way or another. The reason I wrote the books, the reason I'm standing here right now is trying to raise awareness. Um, the media are actually a really good way to get to lots of people. Um, so this was the front page of a national newspaper in the UK. When we launched this charity, they gave us the first three pages of a national newspaper all about bumblebees. So one day in May 2006, 190,000 people who buy The Independent every day would have found out something at least, if they didn't skip to page four anyway, um, something about the importance of bumblebees and what they could do to help and, and so on. Um, I think it's really important that we try and keep kids engaged with nature. So, so E.O. Wilson once said that all kids go through a bug phase, but that he just never grew out of his. Um, and I think there's probably a lot of people here that might feel like that, but the sad reality is that most kids do grow out of it. And by the time they're teenagers, their immediate reaction to anything that buzzes or scuttles or crawls is to squash it or swat it or be frightened of it. Uh, so something goes wrong but as kids are growing up, I think, and it's probably largely that they just, it's ignorance. They're not familiar with nature. They don't encounter things enough. They don't get out in the countryside enough, perhaps. Um, anyway, these pictures show, we, we cr to try and kind of begin to combat this, um, we created a two-hour lesson about bumblebees for primary school kids. It was actually aimed at kids in Scotland where the great yellow bumblebee still lives. Um, and this is a before and after shot. So at, at the beginning of the lesson, we asked them to, um, to draw a bumblebee. And they, they, we didn't tell them anything about bumblebees at that point. And they drew, a, they, as you can see, big blobby things with yellow and black stripes, just like I said, the cartoon bees. They're hopelessly inaccurate, wrong numbers of legs and wings and things. Of course, they're only seven. Um, two hours later, we're having learned all about bumblebees, we asked them to draw them again. And they draw much more accurate diagrams. They've got the right numbers of legs and wings. Not that that matters in the slightest, but the important thing is look how much happier they've become. Look at this kid here, <laughs> really bored at the beginning. And look how happy he is two hours later, um, having learnt all about bees. OK. Uh, there are other things you can do. Uh, there are citizen science projects you can get involved in. Um, this is one we've just launched in the UK, a thing called the Buzz Club, which is no good to you, but there is, I saw, just being advertised outside. Bumblebee Watch is a US initiative or a North American initiative where you can, you can I think, take photographs and load, upload them or send them in somehow. There's probably someone here that knows. Anyway, there's a website there. Have a look at that if you want to get involved in recording bumblebees in your own backyard, back in park or whatever. Um, and there are other projects I know as well going on in North America that you might keep an eye out for. And it's really useful. I mean, part, uh, partly it's creating re genuinely useful data for scientists, but it's also a great way to get kids and people of all ages, in fact, involved in actually looking at the bees that live around them. It's amazing how few people... I mean, this whole thing about one species of bee, even keen gardeners who spend all their life out in their garden pottering around have often not noticed that there's more than one type of bee on the flowers, which I find astonishing. But if you actually get people to sit, even for a few minutes, it's really obvious there are different colours and shapes and sizes and so on. So getting people looking is a start. Finally, the, the most obvious thing that you can do is to garden in a wildlife-friendly way. Um, uh, and is, even if you've got a tiny garden or even just a window box in the middle of a city, you can do something for bees. If you grow a few of the right kinds of flowers, the bees will come. They will find you and they will feed on those flowers and you'll be doing something to help. Um, there's loads of websites out there on which flowers are good for bees. Um, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not going to spend long on this, but um, I just wanted to, to give you a quick do and don't, or don't and do, in fact, um, about good flowers and bad flowers for, for, for bees. So these hideous things um, are often called annual bedding plants. So you buy them in the spring in plastic trays that you throw in, the, throw in the bin, you plant them out, and at the end of the summer you rip them up and throw them in the compost heap. Uh, and if you've bothered to watch them at any point in between, you'll have seen no insects on these flowers at all. They're more or less completely useless as far as insects are concerned. They've been very intensively bred for big showy blooms and, and so on, they're extra petals. Often their anthers that produce pollen are replaced by extra sets of petals, they're mutants. Or they've just lost their scent, um, or 
the bees can't get into them because the shape is no longer what it, what it originally was. Essentially, flowers evolved to, to attract insects to pollinate them. These things don't do that anymore. Um, I think they're a travesty and we should get rid of them. Um, they're also, they've almost certainly been treated with a whole load of pesticides before you bought them. Um, which, so it's actually probably a good thing that bees don't go near them. Anyway, get rid of them. Um, <laughs> And I, I, I don't know why the gnome is there, to be honest, but anyway. Um, grow some traditional cottage garden plants, herbs. There's loads to choose from. As I say, there's lots of advice out there on good ones to grow in your area. Um, they tend to be perennials. They're really easy to look after. They don't need anything much doing at all. They look after themselves. And bees are all over them um, through the spring and summer when they flower. Squeeze in a few wildflowers if you can. Now, these are British wildflowers, so don't grow these. Um, but there are lots of beautiful North American wildflowers that you can mix up in your, in your backyard with uh, uh, more traditional garden varieties. People sometimes think that wildflowers will become weeds and take over. Well, it's kind of silly, because of course all flowers were wildflowers once. There are a few weedy plants that you probably wouldn't plant in your garden, but most wildflowers are beautiful, and uh, some of them are incredibly attractive to bees, so squeeze in a few of those as well if you can, and the bees will come. One other thing you can easily do is make a little bee hotel. There was some out there to look at if you wanted some inspirations. Um, you can buy them, and, or you can just make them for nothing if you've got a bit of wood. Um, so this really ugly thing on the left is, is an old wooden post that I stuck in the ground um, a couple of springs ago and just drilled a bunch of holes in, about eight millimeter diameter holes. And within 20 minutes of drilling these holes, one of these mason bees turned up and started investigating. And now this whole post is full of nesting mason bees every, every spring. A bit later in the year, you get leaf cutter bees, which line the holes with little, little discs of leaf that they cut from, particularly roses they like, and they carry back. Um, these things really work almost anywhere in North America or Europe. You, you make some holes in a piece of wood or get some uh, bits of bamboo cane and tie them in a bundle, anything that provides them with little holes, and you'll get nesting bees. Okay, so to finish off, I think bees are a really good way of, of engaging with a broader audience, a kind of a foot in the door um, for persuading people that looking after biodiversity, looking after wildlife is important. It's really easy to explain to people what bees do for us. But of course, um, as I mentioned earlier, actually that's just the start. We really, our, our long-term health as a species depends upon looking after all these other organisms out there that do vital things like controlling pests of our crops or recycling dung and leaf litter to release the nutrients for crops to grow and so on. Um, we should be looking after all of our biodiversity, but bees are a pretty good place to start. Bees have been pollinating our crops for the last 10,000 years, since we started growing crops. And they've been doing so without any thanks from us. But now they're in trouble, um, and they need some help. So I would just urge you all to do something, at least one thing, to help bees. And if everybody does one thing, then it really could make a difference. Okay. Thank you very much. We have time for your questions. Does anyone have? Oh. All right, we've got a question right over here. Uh, what's the evidence that scientists use to know where the bees started in the Himalayas? That's a very good question. Um, the, it's, it's the place with the highest species richness. And if you create... Um, so people use DNA sequences to, to create a phylogenetic tree, a kind of pattern of relatedness of uh, bees. And that can show you which species are kind of oldest or been, been around longest. And a cluster of those species um, appear to live in that part of the world, which suggests that that may be where they originated from. It's far from certain. Um, very difficult to know, you know, what happened 30 million years ago, but it's a, it's a best guess. Next question over here. Yes. I have a very nice garden in the rear of my house, and I'm encouraging flowers and things, but, you know, we're trying to water less. 
and there are a lot of flowers that are very nice to look at, and they're not doing well without getting the, as much water. So I've encouraged my gardener to put in more succulents. Are any bees attracted to succulents? Because they're not really big flowering kind of I'm, things. I'm the wrong person to ask, because I live in a place where it rains all the time, and we don't have to worry about these things. I bet you there's somebody here that knows about... Is, is there about anyone here good... from... I don't know if the Xerxes Society... Does anyone... They're shaking their heads. They don't know. Oh, oh someone in the back, back might know. <laughs> Drought-tolerant native wildflowers are awesome. Drought-tolerant native wildflowers. Okay, next question. Okay, I, have oh. a lot of I have a lot of lavender, and lavender doesn't require a lot of water, and the bees just love it. I have tons no, of No, la lavender naturally lives in, in the Mediterranean where it's similar climate to here. So, yeah, that's, that's. There's a question right up here. Can you explain more about uh, how the mechanics of bees uh, of wing flapping 200 times a second? I find that really hard to visualize that any organism can do that. It's, it's, it's nowhere near the fastest um, wing beat. Um, so some small flies um, are beating their wings three or four times faster than that. That's why they, when you hear a little mosquito going past your ear, it's a really high-pitched zzzz and compared to a bumblebee's drone. Um, which, so the frequency of the wing beat obviously determines the, the, the noise. Um, how they flap their wings 200 times a second, I actually have no idea, I'm afraid. Um, so <laughs> that's a bit of a pathetic answer, but I, the biomechanics of it, I, I don't begin to understand. But I'm reliably informed. It's been very care it's, it's been studied, and there are good, there's very good evidence that that is how fast they're moving. Next question. So I have a question about um, commercial agriculture. So, I mean, it seems to me that the commercial agriculture agriculturalist farmers would also have an, a vested interest in having bees continue. So is, has there been any interaction in between your society or, I mean, you know, could, you, could we persuade the farmer to set aside a half acre to make a, for every half, for every 20,000, you know, for every 17 acres have one that's, you know, something like that. Yeah, yeah. There's, there is work going on in Europe and in California looking at exactly this, at, at how do we put flowers back into the countryside and looking at the economics of it as to how it, what effect it has on the farmer because he's taking land out of cropping to, yeah. to grow flowers, but he gets a better bee population, so he might get better pollination of his crops. And also, so there was a very recent study from, from Europe which showed that it, it may not be necessarily uh, extrapolatable to here, but that if you, they took 8% of farmland out of production and they had control areas where they didn't do that, and the, the total yield they managed to obtain from the areas with 8% of the crop removed was almost identical to the areas without the apes. And because not only did they get better pollination, but they had more natural enemies of the pests. Um, so although some of the land wasn't being used for crops anymore, the land that was was producing a higher yield. Um, and I suspect that's probably broadly true elsewhere, but we need to do a job of persuading farmers to, to, to go down that route because it seems kind of counterintuitive. You know, you'd obviously think the bigger the area of crop you had, the more profit you'll make. But actually, if you go too far, I think the evidence suggests that, that your crop yields start to drop. And obviously the big danger is if bees continue to decline, then crop yields could really start to drop. So yeah, farmers should be on, on, you know, on board here. Um, the problem is, I think, that the, the big kind of agro-industries, the, particularly the people selling pesticides and so on, you know, their interests are in selling lots of pesticides. Um, and uh, they are providing a lot of advice and having a lot of influence on the way that we grow food. So, you know, the, the modern kind of, you know, paradigm of huge fields with loads of pesticides going onto them, it, I don't think it's in the long-term interests of people to be doing that. It's, there are big question marks about how sustainable that is, not just because bees are disappearing, but... The, so there was an estimate the other, the, the, a few weeks ago that, that we're losing 100 billion tonnes of topsoil from the globe every year. That's 15 tonnes per person on the planet, um, essentially largely driven by intensive farming. 
Um, well, obviously, you know, if we use up the soil, um, then we're not going to be able to grow crops in 50 or 100 years' time. Um, so if we lose the bees, lose the soil, it's not sustainable, I don't think. Um, but it's being pushed by some very powerful lobbies, and we need to find a way to fight back, I think. Next question. Does organic agriculture solve the bees' problems, or is it a real question of monoculture versus diversity? Organic farming is good in the sense that it stops bees being exposed to, to a cocktail of pesticides. But um, organic, depends, depending on how it's done, there can still be no flowers, as you say. It's, it can still be close to a monoculture. Um, so organic farms are not necessarily full of huge, thriving bee populations. But not poisoning the bees has got to be a step in the right direction, it seems to me. The next question's right over here. Um, I just wanted to uh, let you know that the uh, Berkeley Urban Bee uh, Garden, uh, we have flyers on the research that's being done of putting hedgerows in farms <clears throat> to see if that helps. And also we have uh, tours that we do once a month where you could come and take a look at the uh, drought tolerant native plants uh, for California that bees uh, need and like and do well. It's, it's, it's worth saying actually, I mean, that, that there's some really great stuff going on in California. It's one of the kind of best places in the world for pollinator research right now. So you shouldn't be listening to me, you should be listening to some local <laughs> expert on the subject. But uh, no, it's really cool so that, and people should go along. Next question. It's actually not a question. It's actually a statement just about awareness. Um, so Obama did use his executive order to um, create a pollinator action plan for the U.S. And so keep that in mind when you're voting that you want to keep, keep the funds going to that kind of research and maybe not so much to war and things like that. So when you're um, electing officials, see if they're be friendly. Okay, we have a question. You don't think President Trump would be quite so bee friendly then? <laughs> um, I have a question with regard to purchasing plants and what type of work is done, because I normally buy from like smaller garden centers, but I was with friends and we went to Home Depot and I was stunned that when we were checking out, the young woman who was helping us basically said, you know, these are all treated with pesticides and they were the type of like local flowers that you would are both drought resistant as well as good for the bees but they were all already sprayed and i was just curious since most like those of us here i'm assuming most of us live in the city and are not having farms what type of work is being done with these distributors of plants all we know is that, so um I think it was Friends of the Earth uh, commissioned a study in North America where they randomly sampled um, a whole load of uh, bee-friendly plants from um, Home Depot and various other places. And lots of them come up um, positive for these neonics and, and other insecticides and other pesticides, um, which is pretty concerning. Um, I, are they not labeled in the, in the US now? I can say that. So basically, the way they're we figured it out after some of the sticks were out, but they put in a little stick that says that it's um, treated with pesticide, but they make no reference to toxicity for pets or bumblebees. And then I was told that a lot of the um, plants that are on the freeways and in medians or big co um, conference centers, that they've also all been the pre-sprayed plants. Yeah. Well. The you can see what, I mean, they want, the garden center wants the plants to look perfect when they're selling them. So, yeah, the suppliers do treat them with loads of uh, pesticides, unfortunately. I'm not sure there is an easy solution right now, apart from growing your own from seed or getting, getting bits of plant from your neighbors and friends and sharing them and growing them that way. Um, anything you buy from a garden center is like, unless, there are a few organic garden centers, but they're very rare, I think. Um, Otherwise, yeah, you risk buying something that's, that's going to do more harm than good, at least in the short term. So thank you for uh, all this. This is awesome. But I wanted uh, sort of an off-topic question. Um, the eye of a bumblebee is a very distinguishing feature of the bee. 
And I'm wondering if you know where the bee is looking or if it can look in different directions. Is it, is it just looking everywhere at once? As, as if you, I, you and your bee friends might have an answer to this. It's <laughs> bothering me the whole time. So, so they, they can see, that with those large round eyes, the facets of the eye are pointing in not quite all directions, but they, they're very different to us. You know, our, our vision is is more or less in, in front of us. Um, they can see probably in about 280 degrees, um, not quite directly behind them, but more like a rabbit's vision, if you like, with the eyes looking sideways. Uh, hmm? they, do, they don't point them. They can't move them like we do. They, they, yeah, I mean, how exactly that works inside a bee's brain, what its, what its picture of the world looks like, I have no idea at all. Um, but they can certainly see in, in all directions, more or less. Um, sorry, that's not a great answer. The next question's right here. Hi, I just had a question about bees and caffeine. Mm -hmm. I've been reading article, you know, yeah. very recently in the press, and I just, who yeah. studies that? <laughs> so, well, so some, some plants produce nectar with caffeine in. Um, I, think, I think citrus has some caffeine in the, in the nectar. Um, and it's just, there's been some really, I, nothing, we, I've not worked on this, but I, um, there's been some really cool stuff suggesting that the plants are doing it deliberately because it actually, the bees like it and, and it makes them more, more active and they come back and they buzz around more, which is kind of, you know, makes intuitive sense. Um, but yeah, so, so that's all I know. But uh, it seems like it's, the plants are kind of trying to manipulate the, the bees. Yeah. Got a question right here? There, there was an article about some robot bees that I, uh, some guy was trying to invent, but I, I kind of think we're, we're a very, very long way from making something. The thing is, bees are very good at pollinating flowers. If someone can invent an artificial bee that's better than a real bee, I'd be pretty impressed. Um, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. What's, what's more worrying, actually, and I, I hope this doesn't ever happen, but um, farmers might, you, you can switch to varieties that self-pollinate. Uh, which would then remove the need for bees. Um, it wouldn't remove the need f for bees for wildflowers and in natural ecosystems, obviously, but it would mean that, f that farmers wouldn't be obliged to look after bees. Well, actually, I'm not sure that they are looking after bees very often, but it would remove the, the need for far you know, that big economic pressure to look after bees, which would be, I think, disastrous. Um, but I don't think there's any other... I, there are a very few places where they, they dust pollen from, from uh, the air, um, but it's, uh, it doesn't work for most crops. Okay, I've got a question over here. Yeah, I'm a, a honey beekeeper, and, from, uh, and also I get it calls to uh, remove uh, bumblebees from uh, bird nest boxes and, uh, and backyards. Um, and we try to relocate them, uh, put them in uh, bumblebee boxes. But sadly, without a great deal of success over time, the, the colonies seem to uh, wither. Um, yeah. do you, have you kept bumblebees before? Or how, how would you go about creating a, a habitat for nesting sites for bumblebees? Well, you can make nest boxes for bumblebees um, in the hope that the queen will find her nest in them. But they don't work very often. I mean, you can buy them commercially uh, or you can make them yourself. Uh, but I don't recommend people try, or, uh, because I had a PhD student who uh, looked at this, and she created 400 bumblebee nest sites of different types. And she, I think if I remember, she had two bumblebee nests. Uh, so it's a pretty thankless uh, business. And it seems that the, I think there are lots of other places that they're happy to nest. There is not a shortage of nest sites in the way that there's a shortage of flowers. Um, but moving existing nests is very difficult. But I think it's partly because by the time anyone notices them, they're usually fully grown and coming to the end of their life anyway. And obviously then the disturbance of moving them doesn't help either. You look as if you want to jump in. Jump in. So she's not, she's not a year underground. She, she, she goes into hibernation in maybe July. 
and then comes, comes out of hibernation in March, something like that. Maybe slightly different here, actually, but that would be what happens in, in, in temperate climates. So she's asleep for maybe eight months, seven, eight months. Um, and her total life expectancy is almost exactly a year. So she, she'll build a nest in the spring, and then, but then her nest and her, she will die in the end of the summer. Just at a, so maybe 13 months. Um, she's, asleep for like she's asleep through most of it, yeah, yeah. More than half of her life. We'll take our last question over here. Actually, I think it was just a clarification on that question. So they actually hibernate. They're actually sleeping unlike honeybees, which are inside awake eating their stores? Yeah, so, so that is why honeybees make honey. They, they have to, it's their food supply for the winter. Um, so that's why they have a great big supply of honey that they stock up in the summer. Bumblebees don't need to do that because um, they're not planning to last the winter. The nests just, so they do make honey, but they just make a, a little bit in case it, it rains for a few days and they can't get out and forage. But they, they have no need to make pounds and pounds of it like honeybees do. So yeah, they, naturally the nests, all the nests die at the end of the summer and only the, the young queens survive the winter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. <laughs>